Let's pray. Father, I pray that you take my words and our thoughts and turn them into a prayer to you. Amen. As I put this talk together, I found myself thinking about the last year and the slow return to normal social life as the pandemic begins to recede after all the lockdowns. It's connected to this talk by how we use and understand rules. Paul is particularly concerned about rules in this passage that we just heard, the passage that contains that lovely section on the fruits of the Spirit. Over the past few months, we have been looking at each of the fruits that the Holy Spirit produces in us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. They have been lovely qualities to think about, especially how they fit into living as a Christian. The problems only really start when we look at them all together. Suddenly, it can all seem a bit daunting. We have to display all these qualities. How, exactly? At once? One after the other? Whenever called upon? All the time? And if I fail to show all these, doesn't that make me a bit of a failure as a Christian? We panic. So to contain our panic, we do what we all do best. We make up rules. I don't mean rules in the sense of ones that are written up into law and voted on by governments. I mean the rules we make up in our heads. We put rules in place to decide what kindness looks like such as showing respect, being empathetic, or being generous. We put rules into place as to who we should be good to, people we see a lot, our family, or people we meet at church. We put rules into place as to how to become joyful, appreciate the small things, laugh more, stop worrying, and so on. There's nothing wrong <coughs> with having these rules, because they can and do point us in the right direction. The rules of lockdown protected us individually and as a community. They helped us to do the right things to protect each other. But these rules can grow and grow and grow. Can you remember some of the confusion over what you did in what tier? Was it two households of six people in total or six households of two people each? Could a person in Tier 1 visit and stay with someone in Tier 2? And could outdoors also be indoors if the doors were open? Etc. Etc. Going back to the fruits of the Spirit, I have taken three of the nine fruits and put against them three things we should do to cultivate that fruit. If I take the other six fruits and hit the repeat button, that will give us 27 things to do in order to produce the fruits of the Spirit. And we can easily add a lot more of things to each of the fruits and find ourselves with hundreds of rules, steps, guides, processes. Call them what you like, but it leads to the same place. We have so many things to do that we will be paralysed into doing nothing. And that doesn't sound anything like the light yoke that Jesus promises or Paul's declaration that Christ has set us free. So at this point, we need to draw breath, step back and listen to what is being said to us beyond the lists we have. Above everything else, Paul is telling us to live by the Spirit. Another way he puts it is to be led by the Spirit. It sounds beautiful. And after all we've said about rules, it feels like a clear, pure drink on a hot summer's day. But what on earth does it mean? I would suggest that living by the Spirit is not something that we do. It's something that the Holy Spirit enables us to do. Let's just say that again. Living by the Spirit is not something that we do. It is something that the Holy Spirit enables us to do. Last week, Sally talked about self-control and said that the paradox is this that we are given self-control by letting go and allowing God to take control. That principle is true of all the fruits. 
Paul talks about the acts of the sinful nature. The sinful nature is simply us before we allow God into our lives, accepting Jesus as our saviour. The acts that Paul describes all sound a bit unsavoury, and we might think, well, that isn't really me. And yet it is, even if only in small amounts. All the things that Paul recounts are things that mar our relationship with God and our relationships with each other. We may feel smug that we have never attended a drunken orgy, but we will all have been infected with envy or jealousy, even if at our lowest of moments. We might not have struggled with witchcraft, but I'm sure that anger or hatred, no matter how brief, has clouded our lives. By contrast, the fruits of the Spirit are things that build up relationships with each other, and with God. But there's an even more fundamental difference between the works of the sinful nature and the fruits of the Spirit. The works of the sinful nature are things that we do, that we cause to happen. Paul reminds us that we left all that behind us at the cross, but we don't stay there. The cross is where we give up the heavy yoke that has been weighing us down and take up Jesus' light yoke of humility. And the signs of that humility are the fruits of the Spirit that grow in us. And only the Spirit can grow them in us. No act of will can make a raspberry bush produce blueberries or an apple tree produce pears. We can be loving and joyful and kind when the mood takes us. We can buy and read every self-help book in the world and we will undoubtedly see some improvement in our self-control. But if we want all these fruits to grow in us and to be able to pick them whenever we need them, then we need the Spirit of God living in us to nurture us and to grow those fruits and to make them available to us when we're most in need of them. In a short while, we will be able to wave goodbye to the rules of lockdown because we will be protected from the Covid virus. We will no longer need those rules because we will not need to worry about protection. But whilst the rules of lockdown did protect us, they also limited us. They limited our contact with each other. They limited our relationships, the chance to laugh together, to eat together. Keeping to the rules kept us safe, but they have also hindered our growth together. For the spirit to grow fully in us, we need to wave goodbye to a different set of rules. Not obviously the rules which keep us safe in our communities and families. I mean those rules that we keep in our heads. The ones which keep God at a distance. The ones we use to kid ourselves that we are really okay and don't need too much help from either God or each other. The ones which prove to us that at least we are better than someone else. We use these rules to protect ourselves from ourselves, but we don't need them anymore because we have God's protection now. We say goodbye to these rules and we also say goodbye to the limits we place on ourselves and embrace the full and free life that Jesus offers us. In fact, we replace them all with a golden rule. You may remember that Sally, when she introduced this series to us, talked about the rule of life, which was simply spending more time with God. Well, in this passage, Paul says that the entire law is summed up in a single commandment, love your neighbour as yourself. It is, of course, the second part of the great commandment that Jesus gives, which starts with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul. So that is what we are called on to do. Living in the spirit is topsy-turvy. It will always demand more of us whilst we feel completely satisfied. It will feel impossible and yet be entirely achievable. We will be given work to do, but we'll feel rested. It won't be easy. Paul ends the section by warning us not to become conceited or to provoke or envy each other. But it will be worthwhile. Amen.